Hi, welcome to Systems Biology, class number nine. Let's all take a nice deep sigh of relief together. <sighs> we made it, we're here, you can relax. Get comfortable in your chair. Get ready for our journey today into optimal rules for gene regulation. This is the last class uh, of the nine classes, and we'll do another class next week, same time. Uh, you don't have to come. It's not going to be in the exam. It's going to be about game theory and stochastic uh, behavior in biology. Uh, if you come, you'll enjoy it. If you don't come, let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> um, I've been told the exam is, an, an, is not in a good date because it's on a fast. So, uh, so, so we're going to try to change it and also People ask me if they won't be on the date of the exam, just uh, ask Owen Choval uh, about that, okay? All right, so, um, by the way, when I came into the class, I saw this uh, giraffe drawn here. What do you think it means? Nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Welcome. So we'll start with a review. You know, last time we talked about uh, optimality, right? This, uh, so uh, this, this class will also talk about optimality in a slightly different sense. Last time we talked about optimality. Um, so This is uh, related to the, um, let's say, philosophical approach to, to biology. A lot of times you see in biology, you measure in biology many things, many facts. For example, that uh, the lac Z protein is expressed at 60,000 copies per cell on average when the cells are full, fully induced. And, well, and one aspect of philosophical uh, point of view is that this is a historical accident or something we need to characterize in biology just like we characterize stamps or beautiful birds in the forest, etc. Collect information. And another um, extreme is that everything has meaning and it can be understood with a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Um, so, um, optimality is one, one tool we have to test hypotheses about meaning, meaning of the biological details that we measure. Why, why are things the way they are? And we'll talk about that uh, today. So, you remember, um, we looked at the lack promoter. LAC operon, which is a classic system in molecular biology. It has three genes, Z, Y, and A. And it has a promoter. And this promoter is regulated by another gene, I, LAC I, which is a repressor. Right? So it makes a repressor protein that binds here and stops the expression of these genes. And when the sugar lactose is around, the repressor goes off the promoter and allows expression of these genes. This is a repressor. I, I didn't tell you last time, but the lac operon has another regulator, CRP, which is an activator. This has the signal, has to do with the sugar lactose. And here the signal is starvation. So, um, if you're starving and you see the sugar lactose, you turn on these genes. If you're not starving and you see the sugar lactose, you don't turn on the genes at high level. That's kind of the logic of the lac operon. And we uh, asked, uh, we, 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 last time we talked about the, the, the expression level, Z, optimizes fitness. For example, growth rate. 
at a given environment. For example, how much lactose around. And we saw that we could plot this fitness function. On the x-axis is z. It's how many proteins per cell you make. And the y-axis is the fitness, for example, growth rate. And in a given environment, if, if you don't make these proteins, this is, there's some lactose around. If you don't make these proteins, you grow slowly. If you make too much of them, you grow slowly. And there's an optimum level where you grow fastest. And we saw that in evolutionary experiments in the lab, the bacteria evolve to the optimal expression level kind of quickly in a few hundred generations. Okay. So this is a um, notion of uh, what sets this optimal expression level. But in the real world, the lactose isn't around always at a constant level. Sometimes it's found, sometimes it's not found. It's found at different levels. In fact, lactose is an example of sugar that's very rarely actually found inside our body where E. coli lives because uh, our intestinal system up takes it up very efficiently. So it's actually a very rare thing to see in the, in the environment. But one general thing, point I'd like to make is we know much more about the molecular circuitry than about the ecology or the environment in which they evolve. So I know much more about the lac operon in great detail than I do about what's going on in the gut where E. coli lives with a thousand, uh, thousands of other bacterial species, phage, sugars, amino acids coming in, toxins, stresses. And it's fascinating in my mind to ask the inverse problem, which is, can we go from the circuits to learn about the ecology in which they evolve? So if you have things like optimality, you can guess something about um, the ecology, which is how much lactose there was, according to things like the selected opti uh, Of course, you can't do this. You, can, you have to measure fluctuating environments, etc. But at least in theory, we can talk about reverse ecology is understanding the environment from the circuit. Did I explain myself? Yeah. So uh, So we're going to ask this question today, to look at uh, a question. And I want to tell you that what, what we'll focus on is the question, why some genes have repressors and other genes have activators, and some genes have both? This question of mode of control. So I want to tell you a little bit about the history. Gene regulation, this fact that uh, E. coli only makes these lac proteins when the sugar lactose is around, this is uh, called gene regulation. And if you go back to 1940, people didn't know about DNA, RNA. They saw that uh, sometimes this activity of breaking down lactose, oh, they knew about DNA and RNA, but they didn't uh, know that DNA encodes the genetic information, that DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein, that there are such things as regulators, which are proteins that bind the DNA. All these things were not known. So I don't know if you can bring yourself back to that point of view. Really unknown. And using the lac operon, uh, scientists in Pasteur Institute, Mono and Jacob, uh, did some experiments on the question of uh, when the lac proteins are made. And they were able to, um, actually they worked on two different problems, on this and on a virus that infects bacteria that seemed completely unconnected. But there were so many similarities between these two problems, we started to see, that they got to working together. And in 1961, they published this paper on the operon model, which was a huge step forward in biology because, it, it, for instance, it understood that there are such things as repressors, proteins that are made, 
and then bind the DNA and change the amount of RNA made. So all these concepts put together in a very beautifully 1961 paper. Black operon is, that's why all biologists know about the black operon. It's like the hydrogen atom of biology. It's, um, but on the other hand, this Monod guy was really charismatic. And he was speaking, you could believe that he's telling the truth, the only truth. And he didn't believe that there was anything but repressors. Because both this virus and lac happen to have repressors, which is protein, when they bind the DNA, they shut things off. And he thought all of biology must work with repressors. With repressors, it's very convenient. With two minuses, you can build a plus, right? So you can, with repressors, are universal. But a few years later, using the same genetic uh, systems that they invented uh, in Pasteur, uh, scientists began to figure out, realize that there's also activators. That is to say, proteins that bind the DNA and increase the rate of transcription, right? So it's, you get the same effect. You turn a gene on and off. But one time you turn it on by having a repressor go off the DNA. Another time you turn it on by having a repressor go on, an activator go on the DNA. So it's two different mechanisms to avoid, to achieve gene regulation. But the dogma by Monod and Jacob was so strong that nobody believed them. They didn't believe themselves almost. So it, had to, it took 10 years, like in the early 70s, for the community to accept that there's activators and repressors. And once that happened, that was uh, a kind of a turning point, according to people I've spoken with, I talked with. Because before that, if there's only repressors, it's kind of, biology is simple. And okay, there's repressors. But now that there's repressors and activators, it's an arbitrary choice whether a gene is turned on by having a, rep a repressor fall off the DNA or an activator bind the DNA. So, and this was just the beginning. When you got into, into the details, you saw that everything in biology is, is so detailed and different between two different genes. And so what's going on there? Are there simple principles? And people stopped believing, a lot of people, that they're simple principles. That, and uh, just a zoo of phenomenon to explain. And this was the start of molecular biology. People here in molecular biology who've learned in the culture of molecular biology can uh, tell you, if you ask them, or your neighbor sitting in this class, how rare it is to get an explanation why is something the way it is. You, you characterize it, but you don't understand why it's like that. And why is there an activator and not a repressor is not a question that you ask so much when you learn molecular biology. But that's exactly what we're going to ask here. Is, is there a principle to understand why a gene is regulated mechanistically by something binding or by something falling off? Okay, so that's the history. is, is very, very interesting. And... So... We're, we're going to ask... Why can you, um, are some genes regulated by a positive mode of control, which means by an activator, and others by a negative mode of control, which means a repressor? I just want to, to make sure that you, you understand. In both cases, you can get a gene that's on and a gene that's off. The difference is that with a repressor, this is the on state. Right, the RNA is made. This is a repressor. With an activator, the activator binds. And here, the off state is where the repressor binds, but the activator doesn't bind. So that's the off state. And if you have genes like E. coli that has two inputs, two different signals, each one can be activator or repressor, you have four possibilities. Activator, activator, repressor, repressor. When you have N inputs, like in our, in our gene, sometimes you have 20 different transcription factors, you have 2 to the power 20, or 2 to the n possibilities of mode of control in order to get a given. So is this arbitrary, historical choice, whatever happened to evolve first, or is there some rules that can tell us? Um, and and uh, So it's important just for me to stress that with activator and repressor, you can achieve the same goal, which is if you put in a signal and you have the expression, you can get any kind of reasonable regulation function, except that it, for a repressor, 
when the signal comes, it goes off the DNA. And for an activator, when the signal comes, it goes on the DNA. But you can get the same input-output relationship. In your pressure setting, you're doing a lot of futile efforts continuously. You need to keep on producing the repressor when you actually don't want anything produced. So it seems to be wasteful from step one. OK, so that's a good um, comment that there, you have to consider making the repressors and the activators. So that's, you're starting to think about differences between them, which we'll talk. Let's, uh, in E. coli, in many cases, you're making the, con the activator continuously and you're making the repressor continuously. So they seem to, have to be equal in that respect. So, um, so here comes Michael Savageau in the 1974 or 5, something He's an uh, electrical engineer, studied literature, electrical engineering, biology. And uh, he says, um, he sees a, a kind of correlation or uh, corresponds between which genes in E. coli. Okay, by that time, there's maybe a hundred different genes characterized, whether they have activator repressor in E. coli. So he looks, he looks at them. And he notices the following correlation. So it's called demand rules. So first, I want to uh, define what demand demand is. So demand is the um, fraction of time in the natural environment when a gene is needed near the high end of its range. So that is to say, how often in an environment do you need the gene to be high relative to itself? It's a fraction of time you need the gene to be expressed. You can see it that way. It's the ecological demand for the gene. Okay. So that's, and the demand rule is that High demand genes um, tend to be regulated by activators. And low demand genes by repressors. So, um, Right, so we talked about um, the mode of regulation, that there's two to the n possibilities if you have n <coughs> regulators for a gene. We just talked of demand, savage with demand rules. So in order to uh, look at this rule, we need to do, yeah? Is it really that easy? So it's like it's, it's one regulator per gene, and it's either a repressor or activator? Or how many things can you divide between these? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if you have two activators, two, two regulators per gene, what do you do? We'll get to that case in a second. So you can think about if there's a, multiple uh, regulators per gene, soon you'll think about, you can say, uh, is the particular signal sensed by that regulator common or not common? Something like that. So I'll show you. It's not easy to do. You need to know the demand, which is something, like I said, is, is we don't know so well. And you need to know the regulation function. And we'll talk about multiple gene regulations. More complicated story. Yeah. Only in e. So his data was in E. coli, and I think it holds for bacteria, as far as I can tell. And one thing I don't know is about uh, yeast and higher organisms. How to generalize? Maybe you'll find out. And the data that he had, like I said, is about 100 genes. So let's just take a look at the kind of data that he used. So I'm going to just write here so you can uh, remember that um, activators, high demand, and repressors is low demand. Rarely, le so activators for commonly needed genes, uh, repressors for rarely needed genes. That's something like that. Um, 
So for example, if, we, if you write some sugars like um, uh, lactose, galactose, and then arabinose, maltose, rhamnose. So this, these noses here are, uh, are sugars. And when you look at inside the gut where E. coli lives, you can see that um, these, uh, these sugars are broken down by human pumps up here. So they, they really don't make it down to where E. coli lives. Very rare to see them. So the demand, you see, is low, low. And these aren't. And they are actually found in the, in the gut. So what will be the mode of regulation? Um, the, this is the lac repressor, like I told you about, and the galactose repressor, lac repressor, gal repressor, and these have activators, all of these, like RSC, mal T, I don't remember. Them. So these are, and there's, let's say, a list of 20 like this, more or less, I'm sure you Other sources of data uh, come from, uh, you, there's ni a nice situation where you don't need to know the demand, you look at two genes that do opposite things. So for example, um, go, uh, X, taking something like, uh, for example, um, what was the uh, arginine? You looked at arginine, right? So this is Vered uh, Sasson here. She's studying this experimentally now. So master student. Arginine. So if there's a, a gene for uptake, there's a take, take you, you transport it if it's not found, and you, the genes for biosynthesis, which is to make it when it's not around. So there's two, two different genes. One brings into the cell if it's around, and one uh, makes it if it's not around. So you see that these two genes have, I don't know, need to know the demand, is to say how, how often arginine is around in the environment, but I can tell you for sure that they'll have opposite demand. So if arginine is very common outside the cell, which of these genes is in high demand? Uptake. Uptake. And which of these genes is in low demand? Biosynthesis. You rarely need to make it from scratch. And if arginine is rare in the environment, it's the opposite. You usually need to make it from scratch. You rarely need to take it up. So whatever happens, whatever the demand, these genes should have opposite modes of regulation, right? That's a prediction. And indeed, they have. So the same uh, transcription factor, in fact, RHR, is a repressor for biosynthesis, and it's an activator for uptake. So that should tell us immediately, according to savage demand rules, something about the ecology of E. coli. Arginine outside the cell is common, right? So. And there's a bunch of those. This, uh, you look at genes that make something, take, take it up or make it from scratch, and you see opposite modes of regulation. And a third line of evidence is when you look at different species. So lactose is rare for E. coli, and it has a repressor. But there's other bacteria for which lactose is common, like bacteria that live in cheese. They see milk all the time. Lactose is milk sugar. And for them, lactose is a main uh, kind of uh, source of carbon. And when you look at those bacteria, you see that they, don't, they have the same lac genes, lac Z, the, the one that breaks it down, the very similar pump, et cetera. But the, active, but the mode of regulation is opposite. They have a lac activator, lactose activator. So that's also data you can, you can take. So all in all, it's not perfect, but it looks like a really good correlation, as far as we can tell, between the ecology and the molecular details. Yeah. So thanks. So we'll get back to this. So there's lac repressor that senses lactose. And there's another one, a CRP, that senses starvation through a molecule called cyclic AMP that activates it and disactivates it. So I think maybe a more appropriate way to say it is that in this um, situation, lactose signal is low demand, it's very rare, and starvation signal is very common. And that's also thought to be the case. The starvation is for glucose, it's very 
rare to have glucose around. So, so the, did I answer your question? Yeah. So, this, uh, and all these are the specific uh, transcription factors for, for that sugar. And they're also regulated positively by CRP. So. Okay, so that's the savage demand rule. Um, let's take it as a given. And the question is, why? Why should there be a re relationship between demand and the mode of regulation? So all of these situations, they can transcribe when they need to, and they don't transcribe when they don't need to. But the question is, why isn't a repressor or activator to achieve the same? If I'm controlling the gene through a repressor, when it's at low demand, it means that most of the time I'm repressing it. Which means that most of the time I am producing the repressor. Yeah, but you're also all, most of the time producing the activator. The activator and repressors are all constitutively produced. That's, as I said before, did I, I don't know, maybe I didn't explain myself, but you, the repressor protein and the activated protein are produced all the time. So what controls the binding versus non-binding? The signal. So if there's lactose around, yeah, I should say that really it's important. Uh, so the way this, the LAC operon works is this, the LAC repressor has, uh, is built in a way that it recognizes the DNA and it also recognizes uh, an inducer lactose that looks very similar to lactose. It's, it's a byproduct of lactose uh, breakdown. And when this allolactose, so when, when allolactose is, is not bound, this one binds the DNA tightly and shuts off transcription. And when allolactose is bound, then the protein changes configuration and it doesn't bind the DNA. And because it's a repressor, this means that the lack of Z genes can be expressed. So this is, this, is the, this is the signal. So all these, this is the signal on this axis. And so you get this relationship. When the more signal there is, the more Z expression there is. But the question is whether to make it with an activator or a repressor. So why are they uh, made even if they're not used most of the time? Because you want fast responses. So. Uh, they're made all the time so that you have a sensor for the signal. And then some of them uh, level increase or decrease with signal, so they're auto-regulated also, as I told you. In the, but uh, that's, a sec that's a second order thing. So because it takes half a cell generation to make them, <laughs> you won't be able to respond to the signal. You have to respond fast, fast, fast. That's why they're made all the time. Very good questions. By the way, I'm wondering, who here has, didn't ask a question yet throughout the entire course? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, thanks. So this is uh, one of your last opportunities to ask. I'd love it to hear from you, too, if you have questions. Especially if you had a question you wanted to ask and didn't ask. Uh, remember how that feels. And maybe you can do that. Um, all right, so uh, Savage had a theory. I'll tell you about it in just a couple of uh, minutes because the theory uh, does, doesn't work so well, uh, but it's still very important because without this theory, he wouldn't test his ideas, right? So in, theories that are wrong are about as important as theories that are right. I want to remember that. Um, so his theory was the following. So he said, uh, it's, about, it's about mutants. He said something like this. Supp suppose we have... Uh, suppose we have, let's say, a high-demand situation, high situation, and we use an activator. If there's a mutation in this activator, the activator, let's say, most mutations destroy things. It's much easier to destroy than to make. Most mutations. If a mutation in this activator, what would happen to the gene? Expression, if the activator is not there, there will be no expression or low expression. But it's a high demand gene. So this is 
very, this is very bad, right? This is big reduc re reduction in fitness is, is large, is high, right? So there's a big selection pressure. Those mutants uh, that are selected against, and the positive regulation remains. But if, there is, if it's a high-demand situation and there's a repressor, and we have a mutation, what happens when you get rid of, an, of a repressor? It's very high expression, right? So that's, a that's one difference between activators and repressors. What happens when you get rid of them? When you get rid of an activator, there's no expression. When you get rid of a repressor, there's high expression, right? Because of Can I explain myself? So because it's high demand, uh, there's le less re reduction in fitness. There is a reduction in fitness because you want to have gene regulation. But it, now there's no regulation, but it, the gene is on all the time. But usually it's needed, so that's less. And therefore, this can be, um, this mutation uh, is less frequently uh, removed from the population. And therefore, he reasoned, over time, uh, repressors would be mutated away until an activator is formed. And when an activator is formed, mutations can't get rid of it anymore because those mut mutants have such a disadvantage that they're erased. That's the theory. And the, the symmetric argument for low demand. This theory um, is, uh, doesn't work because it's based on, on mutants. And both of these mutants have a, a fitness disadvantage. They're both selected. But one is selected against a little bit less. So the reason it doesn't work is that if there is a, a first order difference between activators and repressors, let's say if there's something that is, is different about them, you don't need a mutation, then that difference would lead to a selection pressure that will choose. So in order for this to work, the activator and repressor have to be exactly the same in every possible way, so that the, this tiny mutation effect can win over the absolute difference. It's a second order effect. And also, in order for a mutant that has lower fitness to take over the population, you need very unusual conditions of low, small population sizes and long times, etc. So it's unlikely to, to work. But there's, there's another theory that, um, that's more uh, robust, I can say. So the problems here are it's mutant effect or second order with respect to um, differences in the wild type, in the non-mutant mechanisms. So we can see what, what, what might be the differences between them. Like one difference was already suggested, maybe you need to produce more repressor or more activator, but we'll talk about something Different, more general, I think. <laughs> yeah, two questions. It's trying to argue why high demand genes uh, are connected with activators, not repressors. Because high demand genes, a mutator, mutation in the activator is, is disastrous, mutation in the repressor is less disastrous. Therefore, mutations and repressors might take over the population. Repressors would be lost, but activators would be maintained. So that's, that's a kind of thing. But when you try to calculate it, it doesn't work, actually, when you do the models. And there's Savageau's paper, and there's also a recent paper by a Terry Waugh group, basically showing that it's very, very difficult to get this to work, even if all the fitnesses are the same. Yeah. It looks like... Uh Maybe the design of the cell prefer that the protein will be most of the time bounded or tied to the promoter, <coughs> not float around most of the time. Because I demand to take. Uh, I'm going to stop you right now because you just said the, the answer I'm going to give. So congratulations. <laughs> but give me the pleasure of saying it. Okay. So, uh, so here's another explanation, and it has to do with uh, making a little bit more realistic picture. So here I drew these uh, proteins and DNA in isolation, as if it's the only things that exist. But actually in the cell, there's a lot of other things that can bind the DNA. So there's a question of, uh, uh, so in, in the cell, there's non-specific uh, binding by 
other regulators. So this is, if this is our gene, and this is our you know, transcription factor as it binds to its site, its cognate site, there's a lot of other things that we'll draw as um, weird shapes that can also bind here. And they, their activity, of course, varies with the conditions. So if we're sensing lactose, but there's other conditions around, like salt, temperature, other sugars. So they affect in a way we don't know, we can't know, we can't plan uh, all the activities of all the transcription factors, et cetera. So there's a background binding that can affect gene regulation, which is an unknown. We don't know that in the future what the environment will be. So th there's a background signal that we can't really control. So if we look at the fitness as a, prop, as, a, as a function of the level of expression, and as we saw, we have some optimum, what, what will these things do to our expression level? They'll change the op they'll, they'll take us away from the optimum. They maybe increase or decrease the expression level. So they'll change it. Since we're at the optimum, any change in any direction leads to a reduction in fitness. So, which is called an error load. So, these nonspecific bindings will shift us in some direction, we don't even know the direction, but will uh, reduce our fitness. So they have a fitness cost. <coughs> right? Thus, it's good to keep the regulator, sorry, regulatory, regu, Latory protein bound to its site most of the time because when it's bound these guys can't bind there especially given that it's chemically binds stronger than anything else it's not designed to bind there did I explain myself? So, in times when the regulatory protein that's designed to bind to the site is bound there, it's not exposed to the other things that can bind there. When it's open, it's exposed. When it's open, those bindings can shift the gene expression away from its optimum, and you get an error load. So, minimizing, minimize. The principle is to minimize the error load, maximize the, the fraction of time that the transcription fi factor binds its site. And from this principle, you can derive sufficient de demand rules. Why? It lowers the noise, you can say, the variation between different conditions, maybe. Can it teach us the map of energy? Lower energy uh, constructs, where you know, energy is released as DNA binds, and it's easier to maintain a system at this level? No, this is all um, equilibrium. So binding on binding is this equilibrium process. Not that there's no net gain or loss of energy here. Let's see how minimizing errors can maximize the time to transfer factor by insights. High demand genes, if we want the gene to be expressed most of the time, and we want the regulator to bind most of the time, it means we need to use an activator. Right? High demand genes plus activator um, minimize error load because and and low demand genes benefit by using a repressor because again the regular is bound most of the time if low demand genes use an activator low demand genes need to be off most of the time the activator would spend most of its time off the DNA leaving the promoter open to non-specific binding 
Likewise, if high demand genes use a repressor, they need to be on. The repressor will spend most of the time off the DNA. The site would be open most of the time. So the same principle uh, underlies both of the high demand and low demand cases. So, uh, so uh, we talked about uh, the mutant theory by Savageau, error minimization, error load, and um, the principle that you bind most of the time, therefore high demand genes use an activator, low demand genes use a repressor. Some pe questions people ask me during the break, first of all, is it allowed to ask questions in Hebrew? So the answer is yes, you can ask questions in Hebrew and I'll translate. Don't worry about the English. Second question is, uh, in higher organisms there's other things that happen, like uh, nucleosomes, histones that bind the DNA, situation is more complicated. And I'd like to know how uh, this translates to higher organisms with nucleosome organization, etc. I don't know the answer. Um, and another question was uh, about variability between cells. The situation here, let's say in the nucleus of an organism or inside bacteria, is that these, these transcription factors are found and their activity, the affinity to DNA, depends on different conditions. So this is more a question of difference between different conditions, not stochastic differences between cells in the same condition. Different conditions can lead to different repertoire of non-specific binders, and since you can't predict that, you might like to, to keep the site bound as often as you can. All right, so... By the way, this reduction in error is related to the magnitude of this variation caused by non-specific binding, and to the curvature here near the top. And, and I think in the exercise you get to actually calculate that. Good for you. <laughs> it comes out for numbers like in the lac operon to about 0.1% growth, for example, which is very selectable, as I'll tell you, this error. Okay. That's the order of magnitude, you can say. Um, so let's compute something and then talk about the case of two, two, uh, two or more transcription factors at binding the same promoter. So let's calculate something. Uh, suppose that uh, the demand, so we'll calculate when uh, to use repressor versus activator. So th let's assume that the demand for a gene is P. That's the probability of time it, need it needs to be at relatively high expression for itself and that the error load, the reduction in fitness, is delta fitness L and delta fitness H. This is L, is in, its, its in, in environments when it's not needed, maybe this gene is off completely, maybe it's on in the low level. The, the, this is when the gene is needed here, this error load, delta fitness lo uh, low, but when it's needed in, in, in other environments, it's needed at high levels, this is the error load, delta fitness high. So those are two numbers. Okay. So um, the error load for a repressor is... Um, I just want to check if I'm doing this right. Yeah. So for, um, let's see for a repressor. So um, P is the probability that you need the gene in high, in demand P, that, right? It's the probability you need the gene in its high state. So P percent of the time, the error load will be, high, uh, you, you have the higher error load. And 1 minus p of the time, you'll have the lower error load. Here, the repressor is, uh, is unbound, because it's a repressor, right? And here, it's bound, because it's low expression means bound repressor, and high expression so what I'm going to assume here is that this equals zero. That is to say, there's no error load when it's bound, and there is error load when it's not bound. 
because no error when repressor binds its site. And here we'll have the activator. So uh, uh, so fraction p of the time, we need the gene in its high state. In order to have high state, this is where the activator is bound, because activator bound means high gene expression. And here is when the activator is unbound. Because when it's unbound, you have the low gene expression. So which one can I erase? Which error load can I erase? The bound one, right? Because we assume, according to our theory, that there is no error load when it's bound. So you see, that's the difference between activator and repressor. Now, um, we can say that, um, let's say, activator is more optimal. And therefore, selected by natural evolution, by natural selection, if conditions allow it, when the error load of the activator is less than the error load of repressor, because we want to have minimum errors, minimum reduction in growth rate and fitness. And therefore, when 1 minus p delta f low is smaller than p delta f h, and therefore, the demand delta f h plus delta f l, so I move this p delta f l here, has to be greater than delta f l, or in other words, p is greater then delta F L divided by delta F L plus delta F H. So this is just another way of saying that high demand means activator, right? It's just a way to compute the, the demand at which you put for an activator repressor. Of course, these numbers depend on the form of the fitness function for each gene. You, I told you how to calculate that last time for one gene, but you have to do it for every gene. But at least this tells you that high demand means activator, and of course low demand, for instance, very low, at some point P will go below this, and then a repressor is better. Did I explain myself? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, and another question we can ask is, uh, about historical accidents. So, okay, there's a difference in, in error load between, or fitness between activator and repressor for a given gene. But is this enough to actually uh, be selected? Or maybe this difference is so tiny that it's negligible, and whatever you had before will continue to be there forever. So, uh, um, so, the, well, I'll tell you is that uh, the mode activator or repressor is selected when this, um, this, this fitness difference is greater than a min the minimum minimal selection pressure. So this is a number which says what's the minimal advantage that an organism needs to have in order for its progeny to, f to become fixed, to take over the entire test tube or ecology. And in E. coli, it's, I think I talked about this last time, it's very, we don't know this number, but there's ways to estimate it. And it's on the order of um, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. And these differences, at least for the case we know in the LAC, is 10 to the minus 3. So they're, they're like two orders of three orders of magnitude bigger than the minimal selection pr selective pressure. And you can draw a little diagram, a graph that says, like a phase plane or something like that, that says, um, that if I draw here this, uh, 
delta E, this delta E A minus delta, this, this fitness difference divided by this minimum selection pressure. And this is the demand. Then the high demand genes, you get an activator. Low demand genes, you get a repressor. But if the difference is very small, this area, you have history, which means to say that uh, whatever you had there will stay there, or, something, or historical accident, let's call it. That means no matter what the demand is in the present, you stay with the, with the past. But in fact, this region, we know for the systems that we know, they're well within this region. But you can have a situation where the differences become so tiny that history, historical accidents can matter. What does it mean? It means that the, the error load, the reduction in fitness, due to the... So when you use an activator, there's still a reduction of fitness because some fraction of the time you, you, have to, you have an open repressor. So the reduction in fitness of an activator, in, in situations where the re an activator will be selected over a repressor in situations where its error load is smaller. Thanks for asking. So that's really the kind of questions. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, it's my responsibility that you all understand what I'm talking about. So please ask me these kind of questions. It's kind of the end of the course now, but you have other courses too, right, in the future. Maybe, maybe you'll be teaching. Did I tell you already? I don't remember. If, uh, did I, I don't say, uh, do you understand? I say, did I explain myself? Did I tell you that already? Yeah. So that reminds me that I have to explain it. <laughs> if you don't understand, it's my fault. In the gray area, there isn't any difference, or it's smaller uh, than uh, 10 to the minus 6? Do you mention the gray area of minimal selective pressure? Yes. Yeah, there is a gray area. It's, it's a continuous function of, so the, the probability to be fixed Condition to be fixed has to do with its selection pressure and the population size. And this is the threshold where uh, a muta uh, mutation has a selective pressure, S min, where it gets fixed 50% of the time. If you go to uh, an order of magnitude more, it's an exponential process. It will be fixed almost always. For a mutant. For a mutant, an activator or a mutant in a repressor. And then we talked about the recurrent theory of the uh, yeah. of the binding. And now you showed us the error load yeah. when a mutation occurs. So oh, sorry, it's not when a mutation occurs. I didn't explain. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you. So the error load it has to do with, no, with, there's no mutations. You take a repressor, and a, a, uh, an organism with a repressor, and an organism with an activator, let's assume everything's identical. And you calculate the reduction in fitness that occurs because of nonspecific binding to the pool. So it's a property of the wild type, of the non-mutated organisms. You just compare two designs. And you see that one has an advantage. It's because um, one is able to, have, to keep the promoter shut and therefore have less errors more, more of the time. And that has to do with the demand. I think so. So this is the paper, Gaishinal, Erz Dekel. And myself, 2006. Um, now let's talk about the case where there are two regulators. And from this, you'll be able to expl ex extrapolate, I promise you, to the case of N regulators. Okay? So here's the problem. Suppose you have a gene that has two signals, two regulators. Regulator 1 and regulator 2. Like Lexi and CRP. There are four possible designs. Activator, 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 repressor, repressor, activator, and repressor, repressor. Am I right? Yeah. So how do you, how can we use what I just ta taught you to choose? All right. So um, I'll just write that uh, one and two. <coughs> let's say bound. We'll call it one, and unbound. We'll call it zero. They can either be both unbound, bound, uh, unbound, bound, or bound, bound. Yeah. Why do you uh, ignore the, the logic, like N gate, one gate, whatever? 
So you ask me why I ignore the possibility of logic? So I, you'll, I don't ignore them. So, so whatever the logic is, we'll be able to figure it out. So I'm going to um, uh, just, for example, for the case of activator, activator, okay, I'm going to list here the expression levels. So when is the expression highest for two activators? We're both about. So we know this is the high state. When is the expression lowest? What happens here in the middle? We don't know. This has to do with the logic now. What about um, repressor, repressor? When is the expression highest? When it's lowest? Here in the middle, we have middle one, middle two. What about activator repressor? When is it highest? One zero, because activator is bound, repressor is unbound, that's high. When is it lowest? Activator unbound, repressor bound, that's lowest, right? And then we have um, both of them unbound and both of them. Now I'd like to, you will do a dyad to turn to your neighbor. And you have to find a neighbor. If you don't find a neighbor, you get up and, and find a neighbor. And we're going to talk for a few minutes about what's the principle. When do you choose each one of these? When do you choose AA, AR, R? Okay? You find some, a neighbor, someone sitting next to you. Raise your hand if you don't have a neighbor. You? Yes, sir. Of course, uh, dyad is an ancient uh, Jewish uh, cult uh, tradition of studying by uh, talking to each other, right? Uh, how is it called in Hebrew? Chavruta. Um, so, um, so it's not a test, and it's okay to be wrong. So I'd like to ask uh, if somebody could just say or guess. What, what did you come up with? Or maybe there's... So what's the, what's the principle? So wait, so, um, so we have four expression states here. So you say activator, activator. If, if um, it will be genes that are needed most of the time. Then use activator, activator. Okay, and then uh, repressor, repressor for genes. Okay, so any uh, anyone want to take this another step? Yeah. Uh, we talked about the signal because right. we assume that each regulator has its own signal. That's right. So the activator, activator is when there's a high demand when both signals are present. Right. The repressor, repressor is, is low demand when both signals are present. Right. 
So the so you um, any any other answers? What somebody wants to add or disagree? Yeah. I think you you go by one one. Yeah. Because you want it to be connected on most of the time. So you want one one to be on most of the time. Yeah. So. Um, Right. Of course, you, c you can com compute things just like I said before. The demand here is uh, has to do like um, Ela, Ela, your name is Ella, right? Ella said uh, the, you have now a probability distribution in the environment for having signal one and signal two. Right? So you have this two-dimensional probability distribution, and you'd like to have uh, the error load minimal. So there's four error loads here: delta f high, delta f medium one, delta f medium two, delta f low. And you can compute all of this sums and understand the phase space of when each one is selected. So that's, let's say, the rigorous way to do it. But like the, simp the simple answer, let's say, if you just want to have a, a, a kind of intuitive understanding, is that indeed, um, if, you, um, if you're in a situation where this, so you can also, another way of thinking of it is, you can say, what's the demand to be at H? What's the probability of being at H, at M1, M2, and L? So genes where H is the highest probability situation, and most time in the college you want high expression, you use, so this, so this is the state. One, one. This is the state that's most commonly needed in the environment. So if you most commonly need high, you'll be at 1, 1. If you most commonly need low, sorry, you'll be activated. activated. If you most commonly need low, RR. If you most commonly need M2, you'll be at AR. That's to say, if you most commonly need to be an intermediate level of expression. Because now we have a two-dimensional input function, which can be... Um, which will be a surface, right? Full surface. So if you need to be an intermediate level of expression most of the time, you choose this or repressor activator M, you know. Uh, let's look at the LAC system. It has a repressor and an activator. So in, in the ecology, of E. coli, uh, lactose is rare, and starvation, does it say glucose not present, is common. Therefore, the most common state is one where um, where CRP is bound and LAC I is also bound. And that generates uh, an intermediate level of expression. What it generates is a level of expression where you make the LAC genes in a level that you can detect lactose because those genes, what they, they, one of them encodes the transporter that is needed to bring this lactose into the cell. The second one encodes the enzyme that needs to cut lactose in a special way in order to make it induce the inducer make it into allolactose. So you need both of those genes. So it's a maintenance level. It's not completely shut off. For example, um, if, if, um, if there's glucose present, CRP is unbound. So this, that's the zero, one state. Then it's, it's shut down really so high that there's only one messenger made every nine generations. But that's not the most common state. The most common state is there's glucose starvation, so the CRP is bound and LACI is bound. And that makes a small amount of transporter and enzyme so that you can sense if glucose comes. If glucose comes, it goes, if sorry, lactose comes, it goes in, induces the system, and then you go to the high state. But that's, as I said, a rare situation. So that's, this fits with the ecology of the lactose system. But you see, it's more elaborate because uh, you actually need to know the four fitness error, the four error loads and compute everything. So 
So I want to end with a quote from, uh, or maybe before I do that, maybe I want to ask, is there any, any comments or questions? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about gates here in this context. So let's imagine two activators. So no matter what the gate, uh, if they're both unbound, it will be low. If they're both bound, it will be high. Unless there is a, something like exclusive OR. Yeah, so exclusive OR. And then these two states. So if it's an OR gate. Um, it could be like low, high, high, high. And if it's an AND gate, it will be low, 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 high. And if it's an exclusive OR gate, which means that either one gives you high expression and both of them together give you no expression, which is uh, exceedingly rare, apparently, but then you can get low, high, high, low. And then the logic matters very much. And then you can ask, even you see, let's say, if you see an exclusive OR, what can you say about the ecology? So I leave that as a question to you. If this project of reverse ecology, then think about that. Um, good. Uh, more questions? So the question is, let's say when an activator like CRP binds, it, even when it's bound, it's, its signal is cyclic AMP, which binds physically to CRP and changes its conformation and increases its affinity to DNA by a factor of 10. And it binds maybe for a second, goes off, then in another tenth of a second, another one binds, goes off. So in the bound state in bacteria, um, the bound state also includes uh, falling off the DNA a little bit. The thing is, um, the fraction of time that the DNA is exposed is much smaller when it's bound than when it's unbound in the state that it's, its affinity is very low and then it can't. And also if, if there's something already bound to the DNA, something with high affinity can, in the equilibrium situation, uh, efficiently displace it, you can say, even though it's an equilibrium process, and then something with a low affinity. So, so it's not absolutely always bound. Black eye is very tight, so it binds a, a lot of the time. And in eukaryotes, you can have binding that's really very, very tight. Like, so uh, it's, a, it's a matter of degree. Did I explain? Yeah, OK, but then also the other thing, right? So it doesn't. Yeah, it's kind of, you can, you can say, that's why the, there's still an error. There's still, thank you. There's still an error load when it's bound. And I set it to 0, but it, maybe it's a small thing. Absolutely. Yeah, to test it, right? Because we can always only falsify theories. So um, that's one thing we're doing right now in the lab, as I said, Veled is doing. Um, there's a few ways to, you can think of testing it. For example, um, you can. You change the ecology and let it evolve under the new ecology and see if regulation changes. Yeah, so you can, you can evolve things. I can explain last time in a situation where the signal is present, high demand, low demand, and see what evolves. And you can uh, measure the, the error loads experimentally by measuring fitness differences. You can compete two strains in the same environment, see which one wins. So there's definitely ways to test. And also you can do a historical comparison. Like I say, look at um, different bacteria and see which one of them have an activator or repressor for a given system and look at their ecology. All these things there. And maybe uh, you can think of additional experiments. So next time I teach this class, I hope to present some experimental evidence. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So I want to end up with a quote from Savage Joe in 1980. He wrote a nice review paper, and he says this. Um, Differences in biochemical details might be the result of historical accidents, and they are functionally neutral, or they might be governed by additional rules that have yet to be determined. One can always assume that certain differences are the result of historical accident, but such explanations, that things are the result of historical accidents, have no predictive power, and they tend to stifle the search for alternative hypotheses. If you say, ah, it's just historical difference. It generally tends to be more productive if one starts with the working hypothesis that there are rules. One may end up attributing differences to historical accident, but in my opinion, it is a mistake to start there. Okay, so let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. And those of you that want, I'll see you next week. Another one, those of you that don't, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>